Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, the cyber strike felt round the world. We head live to London, just one place where ransomware struck to discuss the fallout. Plus, Waymo doubles down on its war with Uber by forming an alliance with its biggest competitor. We'll dig into Alphabet's new deal with Lyft. And as retailers struggle to stay above water, one industry standout continues to cash in. Our exclusive interview with Stitch Fix CEO Katrina Lake on staying a cut above the rest. But first, to our lead. Over the weekend, a global cyber attack snowballed to infect more than 200,000 computers in 150 countries. It hit systems ranging from the UK's National Health Service to Russia's Ministry of Interior. And the fallout is expected to continue. While governments and companies work to contain the attack, Homeland Security Advisor Tom Bassett spoke at the White House and denied the U.S. is responsible. This was a vulnerability exploit as one part of a much larger tool that was put together by the culpable parties and not by the U.S. government. So this was not uh, a tool developed by the NSA to hold ransom data. This was a tool developed by culpable parties, potentially criminals or foreign nation states, that have put it together in such a way so as to deliver it with phishing emails, put it into embedded uh, documents, and cause infection, encryption, and locking. For more now, Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde joins us in London. And from Boston, we're joined by Patrick Morley, CEO of Carbon Black. Car Caroline, I want to start with you because uh, the origin of this attack is incredibly compli complicated, as you heard the White House uh, speaking there. Talk to us about how this started. Yeah, the mudslinging was already being directed at the NSA, the National Security Agency of the U.S., saying that, remember, back earlier this year, some of its own, so own tools had been dumped on the public Internet by hackers. Now, the blame was really being aimed at one particular tool called Eternal Blue. Now, this is meant to really penetrate a vulnerability within Microsoft's operating system. So it was able to spread many feeling initially it was phishing emails. That's now been backtracked on by many cybersecurity experts and they're saying actually the blame lies within sharing of documents when you're using Microsoft's operating system now remember when this was dumped by the so-called shadow brokers who were the hackers who got to the NSA Microsoft did send out a patch back in March saying look update your systems and you will be safe but many of the I companies hear, the Carol. institutions that have been hit have of course been perhaps not the most tech savvy NHS national health system here in the UK perhaps have old systems haven't been updating haven't got the complexity and the costs really in their grip and so this has been able to spread and notably you heard Microsoft at the very top blaming perhaps the United States we heard from of course the key Microsoft president and chief legal officer Brad Smith writing on Sunday saying look the US military have something basically equivalent to their own Tomahawk missiles being stolen here. He's trying to hint that maybe the NSA is to blame. It looks as though the Homeland Security are backing away from that. Brad Smith also saying that this attack should be a wake-up call for the industry. <clears throat> Patrick, I want to talk about the reach of this. I mean, FedEx here in the United States affected major telecom giants in Spain, hospitals in Japan and Indonesia. What does that tell you about the actual target and intention behind this attack? Well, I think it reinforces again that uh, cybersecurity is a very important issue, uh, and it reinforces that it's a weapon that can be used in the wrong hands in a way that's very bad for global, the global economy. Uh, and the breadth of this, th there was nothing novel in this attack. It was just put together leveraging a set of, of things that have been known for quite some time, but it was done in such a broad way that again, it brings home how vulnerable uh, the economy is on a global basis. What's quite interesting, Patrick, is perhaps Asia didn't quite kick off in the way many anticipated. Everyone was bracing themselves for yet more panic. And yes, China had, well, up to 40,000 of their computers hit as expected, but many more thought it would be much bigger across Asia and prolific. Why perhaps hasn't it been? Patrick. 
Looks like Patrick's having a little bit trouble hearing Caroline. So, um, Patrick, you know, I would like to ask you about the, the continued fallout from this attack. Caroline mentioned that in Asia, it took a little bit uh, of a longer time to pick up. Are you expecting more fallout from this attack and where? Yeah, I think we, we will continue uh, to see additional companies and, and, uh, that are hit by the attack. If you, if you look at the way the attack, what the attack is relying on, it's relying on two primary things. One, uh, user behavior, that people are opening things, uh, they're getting fished, what's called fishing in the industry. And then the second thing is that you have vulnerable systems. That's the primary combination uh, that uh, the adversary is hoping for to gain money. And so I, we will continue to see a long tail on this with uh, additional uh, organizations getting hit. The, the, the media coverage actually I think has been a real benefit because it's woken up a lot of organizations and individuals that they should be smart uh, before they open uh, emails. Patrick, I want to talk a little bit about the ransom aspect of this. The way that this works is that uh, malware penetrates a computer, locks the user out, and that in order to get back in, they have to pay the perpetrator $300 in Bitcoin or twice as much if you're not using Bitcoin. You know, what do you make of, of this tactic? Of, of course, Bitcoin is something that's more difficult to track, but even so, couldn't that lead directly to the people who are behind this? Well, this is, uh, there, is a, there is a large uh, underground that has been built from an or organized crime syndicate around this on a worldwide basis. Uh, and they've built mechanisms very effectively to make it challenging to find them. And a simple way to think about it is that because they've hacked other machines around the world, they, they can obfuscate uh, their IP, they can obfuscate a lot of information around them. So they're harder to find than you would think. Uh, two years ago, the FBI said ransomware was a $24 million problem. Last year, $850 million. This year, it'll be well over a billion dollars. Uh, organized crime is making a lot of money doing this, and it's causing a lot of challenges uh, for businesses around the world. And, and we have, this is just another step along the way. We have not seen uh, the biggest, baddest yet. So, Patrick, what are businesses supposed to do? I mean, do they pay? Do they wait it out? Well, we would tell businesses not to pay, and when we talk to our customers and our prospects out there, our prospects that have been hit in the past, we, we see most organizations not paying uh, and using this, again, as a, as a way to have a conversation with the CEO, the executive team, and the board about uh, how to implement smart security in today's world that is a hyper-connected world. Uh, and, and much of what we see in this attack comes down to basics. Patch your systems, educate your users, back up your computers, and as, as the CEO of Carbon Black, I would tell you to be very smart about using next-gen security products on your endpoints, on your devices. Now, Caroline, I know you've been looking into just how far this has reached. Talk to us a little bit about uh, the extent of where these computer systems have been hit around the world. Well, as we were saying, what is it, 200,000 different computers, 150 different countries, as you mentioned. Here, it's really been the, the very infrastructure of the United Kingdom. It was the national health system, as you mentioned. The, in Spain, we had the telecoms giant, I mean, of all companies to be hit. In Germany, a beacon of efficiency and their own German rail track, Deutsche Bahn, was hit as well. But as we hear from US to Russia, I think what's notable, Emily, and I leave you on this, though, is actually the money being extorted isn't that much. $300 a pop, only six. 60,000 has been paid so far. Now, that's according to Elliptic Labs, Labs which tracks the use of, of illicit internet currency of Bitcoin. That means only 200 people have paid up so far. <laughs> it, it is quite a perplexing attack. We're going to continue to follow, follow this as the fallout potentially continues. Our Caroline Hyde in London, as well as Patrick Morley, CEO of Carbon Black, joining us there from Boston. Now, Snap continues to recover from losses after last week's 21% plunge as news breaks of the institutional owners now reporting stakes in the app. Some of the largest Snap stakes disclosed so far, Fidelity with a 33.2 million share stake, Co2 Management with a 21 million share stake, and Jenison with 5.29 million shares. George Soros also owns a new stake in Snap. Snap shares jumped more than 8% in Monday trade, according to gains Friday, adding gains to Friday that have retraced about two-thirds of Thursday's earnings-related correction. Coming up, another blow to Uber as Waymo partners up with rival Lyft. How this could impact the ride-sharing wars next? This is Bloomberg.
The battle over autonomous cars just got a lot more interesting. Alphabet's Waymo is teaming up with Lyft on a plan to s test self-driving cars on the road. This only escalates Waymo's ongoing battle with Uber by partnering with its biggest rival in the United States. Waymo is currently suing Uber, claiming the ride-hailing company is using trade secrets stolen by former Waymo engineer Anthony Lewandowski to develop self-driving technology. Our Bloomberg tech reporter Eric Newcomer, who covers Uber, joins us now which, with more. So how much of a threat is this new partnership to Uber? Yeah, well, it's the enemy of my enemy is my friend. <laughs> but this is also potentially very useful to Waymo to have a way to deploy their self-driving cars through Lyft. I think it makes Waymo and Lyft, if they're actually able to do something with this, much, a much more credible threat to Uber. So I guess in that sense, it is a threat. There's so much we don't know about sort of the autonomous landscape and how these companies will actually compete. But it's it's definitely a strong partnership for Waymo and Lyft. Now, at the same time, a judge is weighing whether to freeze Uber's self-driving efforts altogether as this case proceeds. What is the latest So, So we just got word on the preliminary injunction, which was really the most imminent barrier to Uber's self-driving car program. The judge basically said Anthony Lewandowski, the head of your program, or the former head, can't be involved in LiDAR, these lasers that the cars use to see everything around. Uber had basically already done that. So the, the preliminary injunction isn't stopping Uber from doing a lot of the work it was already doing. Uber can keep going forward. So that's not a big a th of a threat. I think the threat is more just the judge seemed to say things that looked pretty good for Waymo and therefore bad for Uber's defense. Now, some industry observers have mentioned that Uber doesn't actually need the technology that was supposedly stolen from Alphabet from Waymo, right. Waymo in order to right. build their self-driving cars. Is that true? I mean, all along, Uber's been using Velodyne LiDAR to sort of see what's going on and then has been researching their own method. Now, the problem is Velodyne just doesn't have enough LiDAR for Uber or any of these other companies. It's expensive. At the end of the day, if the goal of self-driving cars is to be cheaper than human drivers, you know, the, the companies sort of want to be able to develop the technology to make it less expensive down the road. So, net-net. Are Uber self-driving efforts in peril? I, you know, I, I think it still hangs on this case, but the timeline to find out is much further off. Like, the initial fear was about this preliminary injunction. We seem to have gotten past that. And now it's how this court battle, which will take a lot of time, sort of turns out what the, what the ultimate consequences are. But it seems like they're allowed to go forward for now, and that's good for Uber. All right. Eric Newcomer, who covers Uber for Bloomberg Technology, thanks so much Thank for you. that update. Staying with Uber now, another ongoing battle for the company, regulatory hurdles in the EU. The former head of Uber Italy, Benedetta Lucini, joins us now from New York. Lucini is also the founder of Oval Money, a new fintech startup. We're going to get to that, Benedetta, in a moment. But first, I have to ask you, what is your take on this new partnership between Waymo and Lyft? Do you think it's a threat to Uber's business? Um, honestly, I think that any partnership that can help autonomous cars get on the road is a great one. So I think there's space for a lot of players in the market and the idea behind Uber was always to take more cars off the road and, and create more safety for transport. So uh, obviously it can be competitive, but I think that it can always be a good, uh, good incentive for Uber to do more. I'm curious about your own experience at Uber. Obviously, Uber has had its fair share of PR issues over the last few months. Do you think that Travis Kalanick is the person who should still be leading this company? I actually I actually chose Uber uh, because of interviewing with Travis. I think he's a great leader. A lot of what um, he comes out outside of the company is very different from what, how he is internally. I think he's always cared about the way and the direction of the company, and he's said many times that he was going to change. So um, obviously, with a company that's growing so fast, when I joined Uber, we were like a little more than 100 people. Now there's over 6,000. It's really hard to to control, you know, the HR uh, planning and the team around a, such a high growth company. But I really think he's in the best interest uh, of Uber to keep such a devoted leader uh, on board. Now, Uber's quest for world domination has hit resistance in Europe, especially in Italy. Uh, some have tried to actually ban the app altogether. Right now, there's an appeals process going on. How do you think that issue will be resolved in Italy in particular?
Yeah, I mean, I think Uber problems have been uh, um, seen across the world, but what is really strong is that users are really behind the app and they really want to use it. And this we've seen also in Italy, um, the users being very loud and consumer organizations really being loud defending um, the battle that Uber is trying to uh, bring on in Europe, which is to actually liberalize markets that are way more closed than actually you can see in the US. So with very few licenses for tra taxi drivers, and these licenses owned by the actual drivers, it's very hard to, for politicians to stand behind you know, uh, new innovation and competition. But what we've seen is that users have really stood up uh, for the app and for new types of services. And if you come to a European city where Uber works properly, like London, everybody is like loving it and it's, it's, it can be done. I think there has to be a new regulation put in place, but this new regulation has to foster innovation and new leaders in Europe are much more conscious about uh, the importance of innovation. So I'm, I'm very hopeful about uh, uh, new trends for apps like Uber, but not just Uber, to uh, really manage to penetrate the European market. I wonder about that, though, because just last week, a senior advisor to Europe's highest court recommended that Uber has to follow you know, very tough transportation rules, just like every other company. I mean, how is Uber going to overcome all of this resistance? I mean, is it simply by sheer force of will? Um, no, I think that actually it's a lot of a technicality. So the European law actually does not regulate transportation. Transportation and local transportation is left at a local level. And this has created a lot more problems than many other technology companies which have uh, been able to you know, be um, facilitated by regulation that is actually a European wide. So the, part, the point that is very important to, to notice and to uh, underline is the fact that at a EU level, very little can be done about local transportation rules. So this is a little bit uh, the struggle that uh, Uber, but also not just Uber, there's also companies like BlaBlaCar, who is a carpooling company, and it's a French company, and so it's born in Europe. It's also a unicorn. But they had seen a lot of struggles also because regulation around carpooling is not very clear uh, in the European market. Now, I want to talk about your new personal savings app, Obel Money. Um, you say it's powered by collective intelligence, so basically marrying the wisdom of the crowd plus machine learning. How is this different from other savings apps on the market? Yeah, I think that a lot of saving apps in the market are very passive. They allow you to do saving through roundups, for example, or saving through algorithms. What we've really focused on is trying to find a way, and we've teamed up with a lot of behavioral economists to find ways that we can nudge saving behavior positively. So what we've created is steps. It allows users to link uh, saving to their behaviors, like, for example, running, and you can run a certain number of miles and uh, save every time you run, or uh, maybe link it up to your social media and save every time you check into places so this allows to cre a creation of like a little bit more of a gamified solution and making saving a little bit more of a multiplayer and uh, challenging uh, kind of experience that with gamification can help users really um, get traction. And actually our first results um, have been very positive because we see people increase the amount of saving every week right. over time. Interesting stuff. We'll keep our eye on it. Benedetta Lucini, founder of Oval Money and former head of Uber Italy. Thanks, Benedetta, so much for joining us. Coming up, Amazon made its debut as a public company 20 years ago today. Can you believe it? We will recap the last two decades and how much money you could have made next. And speaking of movers, take a look at the U.S. majors, both the S&P 500 and NASDAQ closing at new all-time highs Monday, led by tech and financials. Among the biggest tech movers, NVIDIA, NetApp, and Symantec. This is Bloomberg. Twenty years ago, on May 15, 1997, a Seattle-based online bookstore took to the public market. The company? Amazon. The value? Nearly $440 million. Fast forward to today, this book startup is practically running the e-commerce world. Amazon is now worth $460 billion. The stock trading at around 600 times its price on the day of the IPO.
let's break it down by the numbers. A $10,000 investment back in 1997 would be worth a whopping $4.9 million today. To transform itself into this tech behemoth, Amazon has pumped cash into areas like Amazon Prime, Amazon Web Services, and its newest project, the Amazon Echo AI platform. And while this cash burn has worried many investors, Amazon has now turned a profit for eight straight quarters, thanks in part to the strength of its cloud computing business, AWS. And Amazon's market cap now dwarfs that of America's largest brick and mortar retailer, Walmart, worth almost $230 billion, less than half of Amazon. Now Amazon is stepping even further onto Walmart's turf, opening its own brick and mortar stores, surely a battle royale to watch for the next 20 years. And another story we are watching. Government officials from the European Union and U.S. will meet in Brussels on Wednesday to discuss plans to broaden an in-flight ban on laptops and tablets to flights from Europe entering the United States. The Department of Homeland Security said last week it might expand the ban currently imposed on U.S.-bound flights from 10 Middle Eastern airports. The new security protocol could mean longer security lines and heightened delays. Coming up, as governments and corporations work to contain the global malware attack, there are few, a few winners that came out of the event. Cybersecurity firms, we will discuss next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. French President Emmanuel Macron had his first official meeting today with German Chancellor Angela Merkel. It comes one day after Merkel's party won the vote in Germany's most populous state. Macron's Berlin trip continued a tradition of French presidents making their first foreign trip to Germany. Meantime, President Macron has named center-right mayor Edouard Philippe as French prime minister. It's a move to widen his appeal before next month's parliamentary elections. Philippe is also a member of the Republican Party. The Trump administration accuses the U.S., the Syrian government, of mass killings of thousands of prisoners and burning the bodies in a large crematorium outside the Capitol. The State Department says it believes about 50 Syrian detainees a day are being hanged at a military prison about 45 minutes from Damascus. In Iran, a conservative candidate dropped out of the presidential race there to throw support behind Ibrahim Raisi, the hardliner challenging moderate President Hassan Rouhani. Raisi is believed to be the favorite of the Supreme Leader. Iranians vote Friday in an election believed to be a referendum on the nuclear agreement with, war, with world powers. In Venezuela, protesters mobilized on main roads across the capital city of Caracas for a national sit-in. That is the latest in a month and a half of street demonstrations against President Nicolas Maduro. Opposition leaders are demanding immediate presidential elections. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti, and this is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. Monday here in Washington, 7.30 Tuesday morning already in Sydney. We are joined by Bloomberg's Paul Allen. Paul has a look at the markets. Good morning. Good morning, Elisa. Well, we're already seeing ASX futures pointing up about a third of 1%. Uh, this is after we've seen a rally in the oil price and also more record highs on the S&P and NASDAQ. Uh, locally, we're waiting on the Reserve Bank of Australia minutes from the May meeting. The meeting itself, a bit of a non-event. The RBA keeping the cash rate on hold at 1.5% as expected. The bank doesn't seem in too much hurry to move in either direction either, so we'll be watching for some commentary around household debt and also weak wages growth. Uh, over in Japan, Nikkei futures pointing up as well. Uh, keep an eye on Toshiba. Uh, that was up on Monday despite announcing that huge net loss. A Western Digital has said it's going to take legal action to stop the Toshiba selling its chip unit without consent. Also got earnings today out from the big three Japanese banks. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next.
Technology, I'm Emily Chang. Let's get back to our lead now. More than 200,000 computers in at least 150 countries have been infected by malware. Once the malware infects a computer, users are locked out until they pay the perpetrators $300 worth of Bitcoin. The attack gained momentum over the weekend and businesses and users are bracing themselves for more. We're joined now by our editor-at-large, Corey Johnson. Corey, you've been digging into the impacts of this specifically on small businesses. What are you finding? Well, small businesses are, are sort of the perfect target for ransomware uh, criminals, right? Because uh, they are businesses that rely on their computer systems. They rely on their payment systems. They rely on, on the data that they gather and that they use in their day-to-day -day lives. But they tend to not have the kind of massive IT budgets that might uh, keep them updated in terms of uh, the latest in, in operating system uh, updates and security updates, as well as uh, just the IT uh, staff to track down these problems. In other words, they are the most likely to pay. IBM did a really interesting study uh, about this uh, towards the end of last year where they found sorry, sorry, their study released uh, early this year and they found that 70 percent of the business execs who've been targeted by ransomware actually were willing to pay and with uh, 50 percent of them paying over 40 grand for each uh, in each occasion so those kinds of numbers are over 10 grand and, and 20 percent of paying over 40 grand so uh, the fact that so many of these victims are willing to pay up sort of shows you why they are the perfect target if you do the math and you figure about 200,000 people were affected by this attack, and if 70% typically pay up, yes, it's only 300 bucks, but that would have been a $42 million payout for the ransomware uh, uh, criminals behind this thing. So that's the kind of payout these, these bad guys are used to uh, uh, inflicting. Now, in addition to apparently the perpetrators, there are also com some companies that are benefiting from that. Who are they? Well, certainly uh, in terms of stock market moves, the market kind of goes willy-nilly and buys up any kind of cybersecurity stock on the day when the news crosses and forgets about it a couple days later. But you've seen it in particular, uh, some, some of the smaller companies that are really focused on this have seen a great benefit. So you saw this in the moves today in FireEye, Symantec, uh, Proofpoint, and others. Uh, but one of the companies that uh, we pay attention to, a much smaller company, about a 500 million market cap company, is Carbonite. Carbonite has made a very specific focus of their backup business saying protect yourself from ransomware. And they've made a, a big part of their messaging over the course of the last year, let alone their technological solution. And as a result, you've seen Carbonite shares up 121% over the last year. You've seen uh, uh, gains in terms of uh, sales for this company have been uh, spectacular over the, uh, over the last uh, year. I think sales up uh, nearly 50% in 2016, 53% indeed. So uh, not just a beneficiary over the last couple of days, but really a long-term beneficiary, not just in the stock market, but in the way that their business is growing on the heels of these rampant cyber uh, security uh, ransomware attacks. All right, Corey Johnson, our editor at large, we're going to continue to watch uh, this particular ransomware yeah. attack. We'll bring you any updates as we have them. Now, digital assistants are the popular kids on the block in 2017, from Amazon's Alexa to Google Home. Now, another startup wants to be part of the in crowd. Lighthouse has developed an interactive assistant for the home that leverages deep learning and 3D sensing technology to keep residents connected to their homes while they're away. The startup has the support of tech heavyweights like Android co-founder Andy Rubin and Udacity founder Sebastian Thrun, also known as the founder of father of the self-driving car. Joining me now to discuss Lighthouse co-founder and CEO Alex Teichman and from New York, our Bloomberg tech reporter Max Chafkin. Alex, I want to start with you. Describe how the technology works here. I've heard it described as if Amazon's Alexa keeps you connected to the outside world when you're at home, mm -hmm. your company keeps you connected to your home while you're in the outside world. Right. So fundamentally, what's going on here is it's the combination of 3D sensing um, and deep learning. This makes it possible for us to understand what is what in the environment, to understand that's a dog and that's a child and that's a person and maybe even that's your mother, that sort of thing. Um, this lets us behave intelligently. This, this lets you ask a lighthouse you know, to tell you about the things you care most about. You can literally say, you know, hey, lighthouse, let me know when you see someone at the front door with the dog while I'm out. And it will actually just do that. How much of a market is there for this? Because even though the connected home sounds great, it sounds like a lot of very few people have actually gone to the trouble to actually connect their home because it is very difficult. At what point does this become mainstream behavior and not niche behavior? So there's millions of home cameras out there right now. And you know they provide a great service in terms of recording data and giving you access to that data. But really what we're doing is making that data useful, making that, you know, giving you actionable insight, giving you information. And that's what people really care about when they get a home camera. And you know, we call this an interactive assistant because it's so much more than that. That you can, you know, you tell it what you care about and it tells you when those things happen. 
Am Apple, Amazon, Google, you've got the biggest tech giants also you know, trying to stake out their territory in the world of AI. Max, I'm curious, who's doing it best or is it anyone's game? I mean, right now, I think Amazon is is probably the, the most interesting one. Um, you know, c combined with the, the sort of uptick of people buying these Echo devices, which kind of looked ridiculous when when they were released. I think I think a lot of us were like, who who wants this thing? And uh, and now they're they're really taking off. They the the products that they've announced over the last couple of weeks that involve video are really interesting. And and then when you add calling on top of it, as Amazon just did, it starts to make you think, huh? Like I, maybe maybe this is kind of the next smartphone. Maybe Amazon owns the operating system of the home. Um, what's interesting, though, is that you also have other players who are who are also making plays at the home. So, it's, so there's a like Lighthouse. So there's a lot of sort of interesting activity here, but I don't think it's clear, you know, how it shakes out at all. What do you think, Alex? What's the answer to that question? Well. You know, we, we see the different offerings in this space as being um, kind of complementary, right? Like, it really is that, you know, Alexa is a fantastic way to connect to the outside world when you're at home, and Lighthouse is a fantastic way to connect to the home when you're out in the world. But how many devices am I going to need? Well, it depends what you specifically are looking for, right? Um, you know, if, if what you're most excited about is understanding what's happening at home while you're out, then Lighthouse is a fantastic choice. Are privacy and security issues of concern here? I mean, just the fact that you've got a camera inside your home monitoring you, it sounds a little big brother. So privacy and security are, of course, fundamental to what we're doing, right? This is data from your home, and, and trust is of the utmost important here. Um, so we've built in bank level security measures all across the products, and uh, only you see your data. Max, what's your take on that? I mean, what are you hearing from uh, potential customers? I mean, I think people are getting comfortable with the privacy issues. I mean, you know, I have a Nest camera in my um, in my kids' room, and uh, you know, Nest is owned by a big company, Google, that makes a lot of money selling data, and yet here I am, you know, using it and and, and not thinking too much about it. I mean, in a lot of ways, we've we've given up more to these companies um, in terms of privacy than than anything they could learn from you know looking at our homes. I mean, in terms of sort of what's in our email. Um, so I think there's 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 demand for this. People are comfortable with it, and I think what's really interesting here is we're seeing sort of some of these AI things that people have been talking about for a long time, um, you know, machine learning and 3D sensors, those are things that people have been talking about with uh, self-driving cars for, for many years, and, and suddenly we're seeing that technology um, being sold to consumers, um, you know, in this device and, and in devices like it. We're starting to see this maybe an inflection point where AI is, is, is becoming kind of mainstream. Well, AI is going to be a big topic of discussion this week with Google I.O. coming up starting Wednesday. Max Chafkin of Bloomberg Tech, thanks so much. Alex Teichman, CEO of Lighthouse. We will keep our eye on you guys. Thanks for stopping by. Well, thank you. Coming up, while traditional retailers and e-tailers struggle, one e-commerce firm is standing out. The CEO of Stitch Fix will share impressive new revenue numbers and let us in on their shopping secrets. This is Bloomberg. Nordstrom is going through layoffs. J. Crew is in debt. Meantime, e-commerce startups like Fab.com and One Kings Lane have been wiped off the map. And while many retailers and e-tailers have been fighting to stay afloat, there's one company that seems to defy all of this doom and gloom. Online retail startup Stitch Fix revealed that it hit sales of $730 million last year and has been profitable for the last few years. Stitch Fix relies on data, algorithms, and a network of stylists to send clothes to customers on demand. For more on what What's next for the company? We're joined now by Katrina Lake, CEO of Stitch Fix, in an exclusive interview. So uh, there are a lot of clouds over the retail landscape, but somehow you guys have been defying the odds. How did you get there? Um, it it's really customer centricity to the core. And so for us, really being able to focus on what is the customer looking for? How is she, what is fundamentally what matters to her when she buys clothes? And then to really be able to create a business model around that um, was, I think, at the core of what we do. And so our clients, they let us know their preferences. They let us know what how they think about their body. They let us know what they're looking for. And then we're able to really specifically cater to what she's what she's looking for and not have to kind of weed through all the list, all the listings and filter through all the results results and all of the kind of difficulties that people see in e-commerce today. As you grow though, there are going to be new challenges. How do you weather those in the midst of such rapid growth? Yeah, I mean, I, we've at this point we're really at a place where we can scale. We have scaled. We have five distribution centers. We have over 6,000 employees. Um, so we've really built this amazing base from which we can continue to grow and that we can also um, continue to launch new businesses. And so we just launched men's um, 
uh, about eight months ago, and we launched Plus Size very recently. And um, in the men's business, for example, we built a business in six months to be as big as the women's business was three years wow. in. And so um, we've really created this platform, I think, that has all of these additional kind of vectors for growth. Um, and we're at a place now where I think you know we can really focus on that. How much of, are these different businesses contributing individually to the bottom line? I mean, are you know women still your bread and butter? Um, is it men's? Is it maternity? Is it women's? Plus is size? still by far our biggest business. Um, we've been really excited to see Plus Size. Plus Size has surpassed our expectations in terms of how well the business has done, how fast it's grown, um, and I think that's a really underserved market and one that we're especially suited well or well suited to serve um, exceptionally well. Now, you haven't raised any funding since this $25 million round. Uh, led by Benchmark in 2014, you've raised 42 million from outside investors. Meantime, you've got Airbnb, Uber raising, Airbnb and Uber raising billions upon billions of dollars, and they're not profitable. You know, do, do you think there's some irresponsibility going on at some of these other companies? I can't, I can't speak to what's going on at other companies, but in our case, I focused really early on unit economics and making sure that we were going to be in control of our own destiny. Um, and so to be able to um, serve the customer the way that we want to serve her and do it in a way that I felt like was um, right for our financial situation, um, I think has served us well. Um, but that being said, you know, there's a lot of investments that we've made, men's and plus size, um, and there are probably other investments that we'll choose to make in the future. What are your capital plans going forward. Do you think you'll raise more money? Um, the, I can't comment on any future financials or any raises that we might do. Or we're future really, IPOs, <laughs> perhaps. Right now, we're really just focused on building our business, on serving our client well, um, and continue to grow the healthy business that we have. So one of the questions about Stitch Fix is, you know, how many clothes do people need? Will customers keep coming back over months and years, um, you know, rather than just a one or two off? You know, how, do you think this is sustainable? Yeah, I think we can actually be best in the world at retention. And so one of the amazing parts about our business is that we have this partnership with our client. So our client is sharing with us how she's feeling, what she's looking for, where she is in her life. And there are absolutely times when our clients will pause and say, I have enough clothes from now. And then they'll come back and say, I just came back from maternity or I'm starting a new job. And so um, that open channel of communication that we have with our clients, I think, enables us to be really good at retention and really understand where she is in her life cycle. Amazon is experimenting with brick and mortar. Is that something that you guys would do? Um, we don't have any specific plans on brick and mortar right now. So Rent the Runway has this idea that uh, clothing can be rented out like Netflix and that people are more likely to rent their wardrobe in the future than they are to buy it. What do you think of that concept? You know, honestly, we haven't experimented much with rental. I think just seeing all the innovation that we see in apparel has been just really exciting. It's a really huge space. Um, there's a lot of different ways that customer behavior has changed. And um, so rental is not something that we've spent much time on. But, um, but you know, we're excited to see how excited the customer is to try apparel and try to buy apparel in new, in new and novel ways. We've just got a question, actually, from one of our Bloomberg listeners. What about the threat from Amazon? Amazon is, is also getting into brick and mortar. They're getting into fashion as well. Yeah, I mean, you can't underestimate Amazon. Amazon's an amazing company. Um, we really think of ourselves as being focused on a, on a different value proposition. And um, so for us, I think there are a lot of product categories where there's a lot of nuance in the decision. And so trying to find jeans, for example, that are just the cheapest jeans that are going to ship to you fastest, like that's not what people are looking for in jeans. They're looking for the jeans that are going to fit their body, that are going to uh, make them feel great. And, um, and I think that's something that's really hard to do in the world of kind of filter and search. Um, and so, you know, we, we definitely don't underestimate them, but at the same time, I think we're focused on a very different value proposition. All right, Katrina Lake, founder and CEO of Stitch Fix. Um, impressive numbers to share. Thanks so much. Thank you. Coming up, we dive into the healthcare space with one company betting that AI technology will one day take over the industry. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Now to a Bloomberg scoop, Pandora is considering a plan to sell its ticket fly business to concentrate instead on its music streaming service. According to people familiar with the matter, the company is still looking for a buyer for the entire company, but selling the ticketing business could be an option if that doesn't happen. Pandora paid $450 million for Ticketfly back in 2015. 
Health care has been on the minds of many as the White House and Congress push to overhaul what is known as Obamacare. The outcome of the Affordable Care Act will have a major impact on the industry, but some are betting the impact will pale in comparison to the transformation already underway. That's the rise of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Bloomberg's Mike McKee recently sat down with Alex Turkeltaub, co-founder and CEO of Rome Analytics from the Light Forum in Stanford, California, and asked about the rise of AI. It's very simple. Right now, the way the healthcare system works, it's a system of inputs. We pay for services rendered, medicines consumed without any understanding of what it actually does for the patient. And the massive transformation that's coming is to pay for value pay for things that actually happen to patients. So when a drug works or a procedure works, we pay commensurate with what it does for a patient. And to do that, you have to understand when a patient walks in the door, given the disease they have, the comorbidities they have, everything you know about them sociologically, everything you know about the provider and the doctor, what is the optimal way to treat that person to get them to the best possible outcome? The moment we do that, three things happen. Number one, the roughly trillion dollars that we estimate that are wasted in the healthcare system, giving things people, people things they don't need, will hopefully be reduced, it can't be eliminated, it will be reduced. Number two, you start creating very different incentives for doctors where they start thinking about how do we optimize what's happening to this patient because we're getting a fixed fee for treating them. And most importantly, you know, having much better outcomes for patients because you have a very creative approach that treats them holistically. And the only way to do all of that is to have artificial intelligence bring the data together and help you get to that outcome. Well, uh, it, it, it sounds like a great idea, but it's an industry that has been based, I mean, hardware is great, but it's been based on the idea of interaction between a patient and a doctor. Yep. How do you change that, or do I, you? I, I don't think the question is changing it. I think if, if you look at the healthcare system today, for the most part, for any disease that's remotely complicated, you have what are called set protocols of how you treat a patient. So you may have an individual interaction with your doctor who makes some decisions. Overall, each hospital, each uh, medical group, et cetera, will have things that they think need to be done, and the insurance companies are aligned in terms of what they're going to pay for. So it's not that we're trying to tell a doctor, you're not doing a good job, let a machine do your job. What we're trying to say is, if a patient comes in and they have melanoma, here are the optimal paths to treat them. And of course your doctor will design what that path is for you, but they'll do it within the framework of something that's been defined by what works best for other patients. And quite frankly, that is best for other patients. How hard is this to do? I mean, uh, medical care and computers have not been easy to marry in the past. When software and computers first came in, it was disruptive, but it was a new industry. Healthcare has been around for centuries. Yep, so there's a massive misunderstanding in healthcare and this idea that there's not enough data to do these predictions. In truth, there is an overwhelming amount of data in healthcare stemming from the data the government releases, data in health records, data in wearables in terms of people's behavior, sociological data. The challenge in healthcare is that that data never talks to each other, number one. And number two, a huge chunk of that data is text data, what's called unstructured data in technical parlance. And so what we at Rome have tried to do is we're building a platform that makes that data integration extraordinarily easy and makes you extract data from text in a way that's meaningful. And just to give you a very simple example, if you look at a health record and a doctor prescribes you a medication for any condition, understanding the context for why that was prescribed requires understanding the text and the notes that the doctor put in there. Just knowing the name of the drug is not sufficient. That's the type of technology that we're building, which we think for the first time now is possible because of the cloud, because of how much data is available, and because of some of the things that my co-founders have built at this very university um, as in terms of the technological platform. One of the things that scares people, though, is health data is very, very personal, and yep. it doesn't seem that anybody can protect anybody's data these days. Yeah, so I don't think that's entirely true either, because if you look at, obviously, this HIPAA protection, which every company operating in the health space has to worry about, but the reality is that we're not trying, for our company, and I think for most of the innovative things in healthcare, the question is not, can we, at the level of Alex Turkletop, look at his specific data and tell you what to do? What we're trying to say is, in a de-identified way, patients who look like Alex Turkletop and meet certain criteria should be getting these types of treatments. And I think you can do that extraordinarily well without getting into the individual problems that that particular patient has. Now, obviously, in rare diseases or areas where there's very few patients, it can be challenging, and it's really important that the government has a framework that evolves. We have a very outdated one. But for the most part, the challenge here isn't privacy. The challenge is a completely different mentality about how you pay for care. And the moment that changes, I think the entire system will change. That was Rome Analytics co-founder and CEO Alex Turkeltaub. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. On Tuesday's show, we'll be joined by former Google Venture CEO Bill Maris in an exclusive interview. This is Bloomberg.